internationalize your JavaScript application, prefer for the next billion internet users. So Google uses this phrase a lot, the next billion, when they talk about um, mobile and a bunch of stuff. So I figured I'd throw up my, my, my presentation, it sounds good. I thought I'd get more turn up, you know, if we're talking about a billion users, but that would happen. So the premise of it, are you prepared for the next billion internet users, most of which don't speak English as their primary language? So today we're going to look at some um, globalization, which is internationalization, localization. We're going to look at some open source libraries. We're going to look at the ethnic group, even nationalization API. Um, we're also going to talk about things like cultures and locales and some character encoding and number and date formatting and generals and portals and translations and a bunch of the parts that, that are just kind of core, core parts of internationalization. This is me. You've seen me on Twitter. Trying to drum support for my talk, there's a the hashtag, there's all the places I am. That's the picture I use everywhere. Um, I'm a software architect up at Thompson Reuters, up in the Twin Cities area. Um, I work on kind of some big internet applications we have there. I focus a lot on JavaScript topics and security topics and a bunch of fun stuff like that. So the premise that we're gonna look uh, look at today is let's say I have this awesome Facebook killer right here. See it takes my name, my salutation, the number of friends I have. Formats a nice description at the bottom, right? But if I'm gonna go out to the, you know, get a billion users, I probably need to have it in different languages. So I've got the same application here. It is in, you know, I'm covering North America first, so Spanish, Mexican Spanish, and the same application in French Canadian. So that's the what we're gonna build up to uh, demoing at the end. So what's internationalization? So this this definition came from that ECMAScript standard kind of verbatim. So means of Designing software so it supports or can be easily adapted to supporting the needs of users speaking different languages, having different cultural expectations, and enables worldwide communication. So, pretty good definition. Then, what's localization? Well, that's the actual adaptation of the specific language and culture. So, you got to internationalize your stuff, then you can localize it for each language. So, globalization then is commonly understood to be the combination of these two things together. So, a lot of these, you know, in conversations, they'll be used interchangeably, um, and that's okay. Probably okay. I just now just use the word globalization um, when I'm talking about it, even though international internationalization seems to be kind of the most common term. Here's a nice picture, you know, got off uh, Wiki Wikipedia there. Shows kind of how the cycle of internationalizing you localize and the whole process or the whole cyclical um, process there is is globalization. So you may also see these terms, L I18n and L10n, L10n. These are kind of the they usually abbreviate um, internationalization and localization because they're so long. So there's something called a numeronym where they took the number of letters between the I and the N, which is 18, and that's how they get I18N. So there's an I, there's 18 characters, and then there's an N. If you're in the internationalization. So you can see the blue, blue characters before. Also, you saw in the previous slide, internationalization and localization with an S, also correct. You know, um, especially in the case. So, Claire asked when your name. <laughs> Expect more laughs. Okay, the ECMAScript Internationalization API. It's actually a complement to the ECMAScript language specification, um, starting with 5.1. Um, so it's part of the core language spec, and it's being implemented by the browser. I didn't even realize until just earlier this year that it was even there. I was looking up some um, some of the release notes for I11, and they talked about how they're supporting this this um, API. I'm like, never heard of it, and I've been you know, I was also working on a, a project that does some internationalization, so I took a look at it and read through it, and so I was kind of surprised it was out there, but it's not like I don't have read everything on the internet, so I shouldn't, shouldn't be that surprised. Um, it's also known as ECMA 402, and that's what I'll refer to it a lot here, because that's easier to say than the ECMAScript internationalization API. Um, the functionality for it was, was pulled up from a a bunch of well-established APIs that already existed, something like the internationalization components for Unicode, it's been around for a long time, the .NET framework and the Java platform. So I looked at those three things to kind of figure out what should be in the core API. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys have heard of the ICU, internationalization components for Unicode. Okay, one person. So, two people. We'll just say, all, all you guys, boy, you're so smart. Everyone knows them. So a lot of this stuff was C and C++ based, and it was Java based, and the IBM did a lot of work kind of putting this together. It's been around a long time. It's kind of a real non-restrictive license to use it. Um, 
And if you look, both Google Chrome and Mozilla Firefox use it under the covers. So they pull in like the bundles, the C library bundles with all the culture files and pull it in and they just use it because all the work's already been done. So um, it's bundled into a bunch of, a bunch of software. Um, well, what is kind of functionality they have? Basically three key pieces, there's some more APIs in this, but there's string comparison, um, there's number formatting, and there's date and time formatting. Date and time formatting and number formatting we do a lot. String comparison and collation, that's a harder problem because when you're in different languages, you, you mean your sort order from A to Z with all the other letters, where do they sort? You know, does a does a U umlaut sort next to a U or which which side of it or is it sort separately? What about like an in, in Inye character? So there are all those those rules, that's a lot of rules, and if they're not baked into a kind of a C library or a platform library, you can't really bake those into an add-on JavaScript library because that's a lot of data and a lot of processing to get all the sorting those. So that's probably the one of the biggest things that um, that the baked-in API gets over over kind of open source platform library or open source libraries are added on top. Um, when we talk about these, we see all these things that are called language tags and there's a whole bunch of abbreviations of a whole bunch of ways you'll see and a lot of times you see this thing called BCP47, you know, which includes these RFCs there. Um, and then you'll also, um, and they have extensions that are registered through these RFCs. Um, but one of these RFCs, the 5646, uses the ISO 639 language codes, and that's ISO 639 is the thing that we'll see a lot too. So there's a lot of a lot of numbers and letters and stuff there. So sometimes I feel like this, right? You know, English sarcasm, Spanglish. These are the languages that I speak. Name, name number one. So here's some real example language tags. ENUS, we've seen that one probably all the time. Uh, ESMX, Espanol for Mexico, and then uh, FRCA, uh, Francais for Canada. And I went on the console, on the Chrome console, and just typed in this because Chrome supports this. You know, here's some locales, it's an array. What's the, uh, do, which locales do you support? And it comes back, and all three of those are supported, not surprisingly. So those would be some pretty common. Um, pretty common now locales to be supported in anything. So what is the browser, real browser support for it? Like I said, I went in Chrome and I did that. Chrome has had this for a while. Um, it's in the Firefox Nightly um, as of a couple weeks ago, so I don't, that probably means it hasn't made it into any other, any other release cycles yet. Um, but you have to enable, um, um, yeah, it got enabled in the Nightly now. You don't have to do anything special. A couple of weeks ago, you still had to get a special special download for it, so you can go there, you can just type in the console there, and you can see my entail dot, and it'll lot of complete some stuff. Internet Explorer 11 has it. Uh, if you have an upgraded to Windows 8.1, you get it. Uh, if you want to do a preview for uh, in Internet Explorer 11, you can do that on, on Windows 7 or Server 2008. So, um, how do they how do they actually work out for the tests and their compliance with the library? Chrome's you know, had, had 20 failures of the trust suite. Um, this was, you know, as a couple of whatever was stable release uh, about two weeks ago when I did this, probably the 10-16 date that I ran the Firefox Nightly is the same um, date I ran each of these. So, you know, 20 fails, 10 fails, 90. So the Firefox Nightly was having full compliance with the test suite. So, so they went from not having anything to their Nightly now is like fully compliant. So, um, Good to know, but that doesn't help most of the people, most of the uh, customers you probably have because they're not probably running Firefox Nightly. Probably not. Maybe that's more likely. I don't know what's more likely if they're running Firefox Nightly or RA 11 at this point, but uh, probably about equal. Um, Chrome, yeah, but that doesn't give it give it all to you. So a whole bunch of other um, blog posts, and like I, I show me, I tweeted out the presentation link at the beginning of this, so you can go through and look at all this stuff later. I don't expect anyone to write down or memorize. Um, any links? A couple good blog blog posts there. So, if I don't have the browser support, what do I do? Is there a polyfill or a backport of the library in there? I did find one um, one similar similar API on GitHub. I haven't used it for uh, for anything. Um, just just kind of didn't get around to take a look at that. But there's something that's out there. Um, one of the ones that probably if somebody has heard of something is probably this one, the jQuery globalized um, function or jQuery globalized library. And this used to be, um, it used to be a jQuery plugin called jQuery global. Um, now it's its own library, a standalone library, and it's called globalized. Now, 
the good thing about the bad thing about renaming is when I was searching for it and I only remember the old name, I couldn't find it. But the bad thing about the old name is if you search in your browser for jQuery and global, um, you will find is jQuery a global object? You know, I mean, you, you, so it's a, it's an SEO nightmare to try and name a library with two two of the most common words in JavaScript. So it was good that they did that, um, but I had to find it on GitHub. Now a lot of the original plugin from jQuery came from Microsoft, and they had extracted a bunch of the culture information from the .NET um, libraries and APIs and dumped it out and built it into the file. So it's really solid, you know, because Microsoft has been doing internationalization for a long time. Um, so that so it was a good good thing to start with. So again, it does culture and date parsing and formatting, and it's got hundreds of languages and countries. So we'll take a little more look at it later. Well, Life has got culture files in there. They they use the um, two letter code. The again, this ISO 639 two letter code. Um, and the two-letter uppercase code for the country or region. Here we see E and US again. Um, there's also, you can use neutral cultures, which are just based on kind of the accepted standards so for uh, anyone speaking that language. So for Spanish, just yes. So that's kind of, probably seen this, seen this a lot before. Um, their API, also not, not a lot to it, um, but it does what it needs to. There's uh, APIs for kind of getting and setting cultures, finding the closest one. They've got a a format function that's kind of overloaded that takes numbers and dates and you pass the options for it. And then a ways to, um, a ways to do localize, which is a string translation table. I can, I can get some mapping um, from you know, one string to another string or, or a key to a string in the language, and then some parsing. Uh, here's some sample, sample cultures from, from Globalize. We'll see ENUS, ESMX, and FRCA again. Um, and it dumps out some of the information. You can see that the native names are there. That's the uh, Angular JS. It's really popular. Who's heard of Angular? Probably everyone who's used Angular for anything. Okay, boy, guy over here has done everything. Awesome. So it's pretty cool. I've actually used Angular uh, not for any production apps, but for both this demo and my last set of code cam demos, and it works really good. I like uh, I like it. I've I've, uh, I've approved its use as much as I get to approve stuff um, on some projects that are that are coming up. Um, so they do have some built-in internationalization and localization support, um, date, time, number, and currency filters to change data. Local is it, some pluralization support, and the local stuff is dependent on some locale rules that are baked in the locale service. All right. Um, there are other sets of libraries that kind of extend some of the functionality. You'll notice there was some translations in that in that stuff. So a couple of these, um, this top one is a is a library. A couple of these other ones are either um, libraries or blog posts to tell you how to write your own stuff. Because it effectively it's some hash maps with key values. So I go get my language hash map and then I have my key value hash map. So it's it's not that not that complicated to kind of figure out how to do translations. Um, and we'll see in some code, and you maybe have a filter that, that, that looks it up and turns it on. But so, so there's some good, um, some good extensions and stuff if you happen to be using Angular and you want to internationalize that. Another library um, that's kind of was not as probably well known. It's called Message Format JS, and this does um, it's like the ICU message format thing for JavaScript. So it implements some of the Things called uh, select filters or choice search filters. I come to call them some select format and plural format stuff. Um, and we'll see an example of that in a second. And there's plans to do in some number and date um, formatting in a in, in a plugin in the future, but I don't know when that would be. Uh, here's an example of of uh, what a formatted message looks like with kind of a um, a select filter and a, a plural filter. So, man, I'm going to be able to sentence, you know, he has no friends or she has one friend or, you know, they have uh, a million friends. So I've got some different different verb tenses in there. I've got some different, um, you know, is it friend or friends? You know, do I want to put the parentheses, S parentheses at the end of my sentence? I have one friends, you know? So if you want to have better English, um, English grammar strings on there, you have to somehow have a have a way to do it. So either you're doing your own string concatenation with this statement, or you have some sort of um, pattern like this. Um, and because this is the same format that the IC library uses, then you could directly reuse your string data or string tables from your server-side application into your client-side application. Um, here's some example usage. Kind of, I just 
kind of went off the cuff and sat down, but you can you create a message format, you get a template, and the template was from the previous slide, compile it up, and then you call it like a function, and you pass in the key value. So gender male, number of friends, zero, pops out, and he has no friends. Gender female, number of friends, one, she has one friend. So that's how that works. Uh, if you want to learn more about it, um, there's actually a fairly recent uh, uh, video, this is, the, this is the author, he's talking about the library, he spends 20 minutes and he does a, likes a whole bunch, gets some history and stuff, it's the guy that wrote the library. Um, need a lot more information from him. So, one of the other, um, when we talked about I, the ICU and I talked about Microsoft, we talked about all these culture files, there's something known as the, the CLDR, the Common Locale Data Repository. Um, so, just a whole bunch of data dumps of all the types of formatting rules and plural rules and language tags and translations, all dumped into big data files, and they're used by a whole bunch of uh, um, a whole bunch of different libraries. The ICU library pulls it in, um, other things pull it in and stuff. So, copy. You want to you man that's where you been sitting over here? Because I have my camera back there. Oh, and right. then. I was, you know, I gotta show my kids and bore them to death the video later. <laughs> awesome. No worries for being late though, it's okay. It just meant that somebody else's talk wasn't as good as mine. I should tweet that, right? People are showing up. <laughs> Whose talk is okay. Uh, the CL the CLDR. Um, it includes a bunch of stuff, and I'm not gonna read all these, I kinda said these translations and script information and country information and quotes, but there's a lot of stuff out there, it's a, it's a good resource, but it's kind of like, to find it, you have to dig a couple, well, I uh, kind of want to do the slideshow, well, then I find the ICU library, then when I'm looking through the docs, then I talk learning about CLDR, and that's the place where a lot of these uh, language file, or these cultures will, um, files will see come from. Um, Twitter has got a CLDR JS library, and they took an extract of all that data, and they generated a bunch of, a bunch of code to do all this formatting based on all that stuff, and there originally was a Ruby, a Ruby gem, um, but then they created a JavaScript version, and they say yeah, it plugs in best to to kind of your Ruby-based app. But I was able to take just the, the script files off of GitHub and load them in, in, into my app, and I got a demo how they're being used. So you can just grab the compiled files uh, that you want, and they do date and time formatting. Um, they also do relative date and time formatting. If you think about it when you look at, at your Twitter stream, they say one minute ago, about an hour ago, they have this kind of like um, time, relative time stuff that they want to put in there. So that probably hit a lot of value for them. Numbers and long short decimal squirrels. So, cultures and locales. Saw this on Facebook the other day. That uh, was an apropos. Turns out here's where the USA fits in worldwide beer and wine consumption. Seems international, doesn't it? Uh -huh. Wine capped in the Vatican. <laughs> I love communion wine counts. Um, okay, ECMA 402. Uh, for cultures, it's all implementation dependent, really. It depends what the browser has got included. But because the browsers are all pulling in that same IC library, um, or it's Microsoft pulling in their .NET stuff, it's all pretty, um, it's probably all pretty, pretty good, pretty well supported. So, oh. Actually, the one, the David Story um, blog post has got a huge comparison of um, when he was going through the different browser implementations and who supports which locale. So it must have taken them a long time to, to go through all of them and see who supports what. Or maybe he just called that support locales out function that I had. Maybe it didn't take them that long. Now that I think about it. But took a lot of work to do the table. So globalized library. Uh, you go in there, their uh, GitHub, you'll see 353 um, JavaScript files that have locales in them. So, even they, they obviously you can't release a library and have to include one, so they bake English into the core library. And then if you pull in, um, if you pull in another one, it adds another another culture. So they'll set a default culture, then they can make in each of these files will add another another culture file into the mix, so you can use stuff. Angular has got um, English bundled into it, but they also have it in a separate a separate external file, so you can pull it in. They, the syntax there is slightly different one. Um, how they provide the modules. And then Angular's got about 287 uh, files that they have. Uh, you can see the comparison between 
English. Here's a one section of the file between English and, and, and French. And so, okay, here's the days of the week. Right. But this is kind of interesting. So when you're looking this character right here, this slash u 0 e 9 so instead of this, this E accent, that they, they did, in their files, they did the Unicode um, escaping of it. Um, so I was, I was looking back, because this was one thing that was interesting, and they, they ended up having a, uh, this is after there was a certain bug, they decided to localize, or to escape all the files, and talk about why in a second. So remember, this is what I, when I did my front out the globalized cultures. That's what I got with these nice, um, but, when I didn't, when I was doing local development using the web store of integrated IDE, just kind of doing some debug stuff, not serving for a web server, and I did the same thing, this is what I would get. And look at my native names, it doesn't, it doesn't look right. So when I print out, that's what I got. So that was because I was really serving up the files without, um, without saying they're, they're UTF-8 files. So once I added the Medicare set UTF-8, into my main um, demo HTML, then everything worked fine. So, kind of when you're doing this, just kind of some local development, which is really easy to do when you're kind of just doing a single page application, not doing services, oh, and then you're trying to do internationalization, you gotta be a little wor uh, wary that you're not gonna load your files right, and because it might be in a language you don't recognize, you might not realize that that's like the misspelling or those aren't the real characters. Now here this is pretty, pretty obvious because we're used to that, and we're probably used to seeing those types of characters, but something to watch out for. Um, other options, you can actually run a little, here's a here's an express um, web server that just turns around and if it's a if it's a JavaScript file, just go ahead and set the care set to UTF-8 and serve it up. Um, and I serve out of a certain directory, so I have a little node express based app that does literally the same thing, except it sets the care set. Um, you got other kinds of options as well, and this all comes from a um, this link at the bottom blog post. So you can convert your source like the AngularJS did to the, the Unicode escaping or the hex escaping. Which, so and you can actually do that using the Algo5.js library just to, just to convert it to uh, ASCII. Um, or you can, on your script tags, you can set the character set in your source. So a couple other options there, but, but a key is making sure that um, you're serving up these language files that have these characters and that, they're, that your browser knows the UTF-8. Um, so let's look at a couple, a couple more characters. So the E, small the E, or the E acute accent, it can be, you know, when you're thinking about escape or encoding, if there's a bunch of different formats, you might use an H, in HTML, you use an HTML entity, either by name, like an E acute, or you'll use the hex value, or you use the decimal value. In JavaScript, you can use a slash U, and you can use a value, or you can just use if it's less than, you know, it's less than FF, right? Or it's FF or less, I should say. You can just slash, slash X into it, which is a little shorter if you're worried about bytes on the wire. Um, what those actually look like in UTF-8, if you actually see that A to the copyright symbol, that's that's the characters being dumped out. The UTF-8 characters being dumped out like they're um, printable characters, or it's C3A9 is how it dumps out. And then the URL, depending if your URL is UTF-8 encoded or not, this is what you might see. So. Um, when you talk about just, okay, escaping characters and code, you know, there's different ways to do it and there's different ways that it shows up, so. Um, same, same thing with the uh, n tilde. All the same types of things, let's go to rough one. And again with the Cedilia, uh, Cedilia. Anyone speak either French or Spanish? That's awesome because then no one will know that I use Google Translate or I mispronounce the words. Okay, um, those three characters that I showed you before, uh, for that, you know, the and the, the, the until the acute and the until So, just went on my Google Chrome console, created a new div, set the inner HTML to those three HTML named entities. Okay, it comes back. Now I get the inner text back from that, and you can tell the browser just automatically translates it for me, just gives me the characters back, right? If I go ahead and I set the inner HTML to that, to the, you know, those three characters, but in each of the different uh, encoding formats, the name format, the hex format, and the decimal format, dump it out, it gives me the same three things back. Um, if I set the inner text and I use the, um, use the JavaScript string and I use the Unicode and the hex string escaping there, yeah, I get the same thing back. Um, I can also call the encode URI component and I'll get back the UTF-8 encoding URL value or I can use the deprecated escape, um, which was always bad because it never used the, you never use UTF-8, just dump stuff out directly as hex. 
So that's one way to do it. I actually escape every time I go in my source code, escapes crossed out because it's supposed to be not used. But you know, for purposes of the demo, it would work pretty good to demonstrate how to keep each of these. Um, if you're trying to actually enter these characters, um, you can find any character you want to. If you're on a Mac, you go to Sifts with Preferences, and you go to your keyboard, and you can check box, show the uh, keyboard character viewer in the menu bar and see that nice little checkbox that I put in front of it. That's a character. I went up here, I typed check. It found me a checkbox, so I copied the character and I put it in my presentation. So it's a good way just to find kind of random random characters in the Unicode space. If you're on Windows, you can you're on start run car, car map, care map, do the same thing. You can do some searches, you can find some characters, you can copy them. Um, somebody in my last presentation told me uh, if you hold down like one of the keys, like Commander Options, and you hit a character on the Mac, it'll be smart enough to try and do the most commonly accented or in love or whatever modified character of that. So I don't do a lot of typing on that, so I didn't know that. Um, another great article that I, I ran across lately is something called uh, JavaScript has a Unicode problem. And it's actually kind of obvious here on the top one because the two NAs look a little differently. But that's probably because the font, when I exported from Google Docs into this PDF, in Google, in Google Chrome on the console, those strings look exactly the same. And I say, are they equal? And it says false. And the reason is the second line there. The first one is using uh, the hex F1 character, which is what we've been seeing before. The second one uses a regular end character and then another character after it. Okay, And that's something known as a, a combining tilde. Okay? So it's got the small Latin N and then the U0303 combining tilde. And that actually is like a modifier character that modifies the previous character and throws something on top of it. So they're both legitimate ways to print to the screen, but they're different strings. And if you take the string length of the second one, it is seven characters, it's not six. So this guy um, put together a, um, a big blog post about that and how they're doing something different with ECMAScript 6 for it and how he's got some libraries that can kind of do some of the comparison. Also, if you try and reverse that string, it's not going to work right because the characters are ordered like that. So there's uh, some things to watch for, especially if you're just getting a data dump and you're looking at it and it looks good on your screen, but it might have the combining characters, not the real characters, right? Um, also, because characters can look the same, but be different characters in Unicode, they might look good, but that's the wrong character, which means it might not sort or compare. So um, there is some, some complicated uh, things. So let's do a little demo. Um, I'm here in my application, which is really just a demo application. A little bigger. So you can see here. Look at that. Yeah, so if I hold the um, the right option key on my Mac and I hit a character like A, it'll just give me something there. Yeah. Uh, Mavericks installed? Yes. Try holding down, <coughs> like hold down the A key like we used to. There's, another, out or be there's another thing too. Oh, just, I'm sorry. Control Command Space is something also new in Mavericks. It pops open, pops open this box. I just learned that one too. And you were saying if I do what? Just hold down the A character and it'll give you an option of all the different A stuff. That's awesome. All right. See, I'm doing stuff at Code Camp too. That is sweet. If I just hit number five, it just pops it in. Oh, that's cool. All right, awesome. I did not know that. Um, is that also new members? I, I just discovered it last week. So accidentally on purpose. Uh, accidentally. <laughs> no, I think it's um, what I was before Mavericks. It, it, it came from iOS. It's mm -hmm. something. Oh, okay. Okay, that's cool to know. I did not. Is it, does it work in iOS too? If I hold yeah, the key down? It's been in iOS for a while. Those Apple guys are stealing for themselves. Well, that's cool. Anyway, you can see, though, from all this typing fun, that now I kind of just have dump all the entities in, um, in hex and then JavaScript, the, the you know, Unicode escaping and the hex escaping, and what the UTF strings would be, and um, you know, all the URLs. So, okay. Interesting. So, all right, so now let's say I got an app and I want to dynamically change the culture or locale I'm in. Okay, so in ECMAScript 402, there's no settable like locale list. You just don't say, okay, I, I'm, in, I'm in English mode. And the reason that they did that is they don't want a global communication channel because that can become some security risk because it's some shared memory between different things in your browser or library. So they didn't do that. Um, and what if you're what if you're like the Google Translate and you got one 
kick one thing on the left, one thing on the right, and you need to support two on the same screen. So what it, those components, well now I can't do that. So they just said that, that stuff is a high level of concern of libraries that are using us, we're not using it. All our APRs are going to take a locale list as a parameter. So the first parameter to that is a locale list. Um, and an interesting thing on that, then you just pass the order that you want things to be resolved in. So if your fallback rules aren't the same as I want to go from um, French Canadian back to French normal French, if you want to fall from French Canadian to English US as your secondary like fallback rule, you can define that in that API. In that API, you just give it the sets of rules that, that you want. Um, Globalize has got a bunch of culture files we talked about. Um, you just kind of include the ones you want. You can actually include it, as many as you want, um, and you just go ahead and then, then enable the one you want to use. You said you call the culture function. Um, in AngularJS, you can't use more than one at the same time. Um, you can't update the locale. The locale is a service that's injected into, into a bunch of stuff. And there's a, uh, so you can only one code one at a time. So if you want to like do what, what I'm doing earlier, I literally have to save my locale I want to change to the local storage and then F5 and refresh oh. the page and then when it loads the new script file it'll look at which one to load. Yeah. Um, that's because in my same app I'm trying to do like multiple things. Now if I was smarter, you know, and I want to just have a path-based section of my of my URL that says, okay, I'm an English, you know, English director, I'm in whatever director I can be, I would do that in smarter ways. But if you're trying to support them on the, you know, dynamically switch them like the old kind of single page job thing, you can't do it. There's a there's kind of a reason why um, you can't hack it in yourself. And the reason why is things like the number filter, um, they'll actually bind to a, um, to some data inside the locale service in, in a closure. So when they're setting up their formats, they'll grab dollar locale.number formats, and now they have captured the number formats from the locale when the filter was loaded closed into the variable formats in their function. Now if I ever change locale, guess what? This function, this filter, doesn't get a new one. It's already kept the data it needed, took a copy of the data, or kept a reference to the old data, so it doesn't go away. So you could try and figure out a way around it, but then you'd have to rewrite all the filters as well. So it's probably not worth it since you're probably not dynamically switching locales in your application without refresh anyway. Um, for number and currency formatting, I thought this was funny. <coughs> You guys saw Austin Powers, okay? So you know he's trying to ransom for a million dollars when he could get a million. This is in Spanish. I thought that was hysterical. My kids didn't laugh either. Uh, the decimal, the decimal point or decimal mark is different in a different, um, you know, bunch of languages. You might know in Europe a lot of times use the comma, and we use the period or the full stop um, in the U.S. and actually even in, in Canada and Mexico, according to this chart. It's another great graph from Wikipedia. Um, text as well, so, okay. Yeah. So, data unavailable gray, I guess they don't have decimals in Africa. I don't know. Um, but I know none of them are editing Wikipedia. That could be, that could be it too. Um, and Asian uses different, different numerals, so. Um, the library support, support this type of thing. So, globalized, they've got four types of number formatting, um, or sort numbers, decimal digits, percentage and, um, uh, percentage and currency. Um, so, and then after that number, format token number, you can put up a, a number, and that's like maybe how many decimal, decimals you want to display, or digits if you're zero padded for the D format. So it's kind of a, a modifier in the formatting. Uh, here's some examples of that. Um, so I got my one, two, three, four, five, dot, six, seven, eight, nine. And I'm gonna format that as a number, and then ironically it says, okay, two, two, two decimal points. I'll run the 6 8. If I say I want an N4, it gives them to me. If I say I want N9, it has five zeros at the end. If I'm going to form that as a D, um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, D4, it'll, only, it'll still give me five, but if I do D9, it has zeros on the left. Now, the interesting thing there is you would, I would have expected this to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 6 rounding up when I did the decimal, not just kind of a straight, like a floor or a truncation. So that was behavior that I actually. I kind of hadn't expected. I can go ahead and because I can um, either set the locale and globalize or pass multiple locales, I can go ahead and I can form, um, uh, format it in ESMX or FRC as well. Just write, write in the same without having to switch a locale. That is a parameter that's there. Um, the ECMA 402 API, they have decimal currency percent. They pass a number of, also a, a number of digits can be passed in as a constraint. Um, and you can disable grouping separators. We'll 
the, this is the full list of the spec what they support for um, options on when you can format strings. Um, but we'll see here that their API is a little more verbose. So if I have it in my favorite number there, 1, 3, 4, 5, that's 6, 7, 8, 9, and I want to just format it as a string, you'll get the normal comma, group separator, decimal, three digits is what their, their, their default is. Um, if I want to do most minimum in digits four, it will give me the four digits. I want to set the fraction digits to zero, and I want to do the use grouping false. That would be similar to the D in globalized, but it actually rounds. Um, I can do the thing where I pad it out to nine digits on the left as well, and I can format it with um, Spanish or French as well. So again, remember that that letter always takes the parameter of the locale. So similar to globalized, I can just I can make the call there. Now, when I was doing some of this. Um, uh, research actually found a bug uh, in, in the Chromium implementation. Um, so I wrote up a bug, it actually was, they found the problem in there, and then actually I was pulling the bug chain, and they isolated it to the, the bisect of the bug, and actually found the bug in their source code for them, and um, I haven't seen resolution on it yet, but they had kind of only were honoring a maximum digits if a minimum digit showed up or something like that. So I got Chromium issue written. So it was good, it was actually, I'm happy it was an issue because I would hate to wrote an issue and then I was just being wrong and then there's a permanent record on the internet. Because <laughs> um, I'm sure everyone reads through the Chromium issues, you know. I'm sure future employers, right, they all search on the uh, Chromium issues to see if they ever messed up, huh? No, they'll just check Facebook. <laughs> um, Twiddle CDI, they have number formatting, decimals, currencies, percents. Um, they can support uh, short and long decimals, so like a million or 2K or 2,000. So they some interesting stuff there. Um, I didn't uh, play around with that, but that was an interesting addition. Um, just like they had relative dates um, um, in their date formatting, they also have this kind of abbreviated numbers. Uh, here's how their stuff works. Same favorite number. I create a new Twitter, Twitter CLDR decimal formatter. I can go ahead and format it. I can format it with a precision of two. I can do a currency formatter, I can pass in the currency, pass in the precision there too. So more, if the API is more of the ECMAScript style, larger options API uh, that goes on. Do you set your uh, locale then, or with the Twitter one? Um, oh, I, I, you can only, oh, good, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, Twitter is like, Angular in that you can only do one locale at a time. Okay. So you could buy. I actually just added the uh, this Twitter stuff in the last like week. Did it last weekend. I didn't have this at my uh, um, when I did this Twin Cities code camp yet. It was kind of on my back. I hadn't got to it yet. Um, but it was. I had to do the same thing I did with the Angular. Only pull in the right the single bit of stuff. That what Twitter does is it takes locale files and it literally generate. It's about 130k JavaScript file per locale. It's actually really huge. It's got all the code in it and it's just it's got all the, the data points bundled into it. Um, and you do, it's defri or defines the same function. So you can't really you can't include more than one at a time because there's I've included it once and now I have a Twitter still there on top level object and it's got a decimal format function. That's a good good. I should have, I should have called that out. Yeah. Um, I can go. See what it looks like. The number. I'm going to make that small again, a little bigger, like that. Okay, so I can go here. You know, I, I got my three up here. I can go four. I can go two, and we'll see if we're seeing changes in the. We'll be seeing changes in the globalized, the Twitter, Twitter format, the style. I'm going to go through them and click on it couple of these to show what's different. So if I want to say, you know, I want this as a decimal, or a percent, or currency, and I can do that. I get currency here, I get percent there, I get some percent there. Does that look right? That doesn't look right, does it? I don't know if I'm using Twitter CL there right for percent. Let's pretend we didn't see that. Um, I can do currency, I can put grouping operators in INTL, I can actually put, this is kind of interesting, this is the, what the U, US formatting for Canadian or for Mexican um, would be, and I can either use the code, the symbol, or the name, and you'll notice it was name is Mexican pesos. Um, if I go here, 
I switch to Spanish, and I reload, because I have to reload, and I go back to number. And I go here to currency, and I go to Mex And I'll have uh, pesos mexicanos on the bottom. So I can actually format Mexican in the English language. In this. So that's kind of an interesting um, matrix of stuff. You're like, okay, it's the you know, different currencies, but he has English values and stuff, so, Canadian dollars, Dol, Dolaris, Canadasius, whatever. So, kind of just uh, interactively how those seem to work, but you have to look at my Twitter decimal, or Twitter percentage format to see what's up with that. Okay, date formatting. Pause for laughs again. National day, it's not dating. Uh -huh. Okay, and Chris Cook also has got their nice options um, API with things like narrow, short, long, two-digit numerics. You can pass in the month, day, year, all the all the different parameters for that. Uh, Globalize has got a bunch of predefined or standard name formats, things like F or capital F, right? Because those are pretty descriptive. Um, but long day, short time. You know, you got just a short day, just a month, year. Here's kind of what their US, um, English US kind of format string looks like behind the covers. You can just use format strings as well if you want to get some specifics. And then if I just move up a date here, um, this is how they show up. And of course, we all remember the dates in JavaScript, their months are zero based because that's so easy to remember. Just reminds us every day that they copied Java. So January isn't the first month, February. Uh, Angular also has a, some, a set of predefined date formats if you haven't used Angular. Um, not a lot of overlap uh, between them, but they've got some similar, similar structures. Um, kind of if you want to compare them side by side, here's the takeaway globalized ones, the Angular JS ones. You can kind of like that. Don't need to memorize them or write them down. Tweet it, you know, check the presentation later. Uh, Twitter skill, they, are, they default only include four date formats, full, long, medium, and short, but they've got a whole bunch of additional formats. You can just call a function and it dumps all these out. I didn't bother going through and figuring out what all these things are. Some of these look kind of interesting. I, this, this, the, uh, some of these E's and Q's, and try to look at what those things are, but there's a bunch of things that are all baked in there. Maybe that's one of the reasons that the library is big, but again, it, came, it was a dump from the IC data feed, so it's got probably everything that the IC likes to define. Um, if I want to create a new date, format, you know, here's my favorite date, right? January 1st, um, 101 p.m. Format is an F, that's what it dumps out. Um, nice and terse, short. If I want to do it with the ECMAScript API, it's a little more to type, right? Um, so maybe all the space savings you get from not including the 45k jQuery globalize you lose in calling all the format strings. <laughs> Um, but I didn't get the same result out of there. Now with the Twitter CLDR date format, I couldn't, if I just did the full, it would actually tack on this UTC minus 600 at the end. It, it, it did it a little different. It did at 1 and 1 p.m. So that's where maybe I should have used one of those other format strings in there, but I didn't, uh, I didn't kind of go through all of them to find them. But those are kind of, that's the, just the default that I was just going to do. Okay, I just want a full, full date on that. That's what it might look like. Um, So look at just if I want to do that, just the time, 1 p.m., just the T there. Here's the nice brief uh, ECMAScript 402 version. And then if I want to do the, the Twitter one, I can also get just their, their format time type short. Gives me the same 1 p.m. So in AngularJS, they have a filter that does um, a bunch of this. So in your, um, in your code, you can just kind of do a filter. So just as a proof of concept, and you shouldn't use this at all, because if you already have Angular, you have date formatting, so why would you use your own day format right? that includes something that only works in Chrome, unless you're doing a demo. But I figured, why not? I'll write a filter. Um, and in that filter, um, I'll take two parameters. I'll take a, a locale first that I want to pass into, and then I'll take I'll take an AngularJS name date, and I'll go ahead and I'll convert it into like the, the API for the Amherst Script 402. The only good thing about it is that I can support multiple locales then in my application. That's the only benefit for us. So if I happen to be in the Chrome and I have it there, I can do it. Um, I can either pass in the um, the name, the Angular-based name, which I mapped it, or you can actually pass in the, 
the ECMAScript or the ECMA 402 uh, options value. So here's kind of what that filter looks like. It's just kind of smart at the beginning about looking for the optional parameters. It goes through, and then there's a big, big switch statement, case statement. It goes through all the all the Angular maps and maps it to the to the parameters, the options maps that we have, and it works. Um, we can actually see this in action now. A little more, some more in demo. So, Angular JS format, medium, short, full date, long date, medium date, short date, medium time, short time. And the uh, Angular JS date is using just their filtered output it, and the inter NITN L date is using my my Angular JS filter to call the other API. So wow, that was amazing. Um, Globalize has got again some different formats. Their full, there's their time, and then their full time, and their short date, and their full day, and their year, and their month. So, and then the Twitter CLDR. These are the full, long, medium, short. So those are kind of the four pre-named baked-in ones. And we might as well. That's just for fun. Let's switch to finish. That's what we have. And we'll see. Oh, uh, because I don't think I had the. Uh, unless they just unless the formats are different there. Um, this isn't. Uh, no, I might not have had the. Uh, oh, the format strings in Angular are of course different between the uh, English, US, and French. So I was actually always applying the. English format strings, even though I was using the French language. So I should actually hit another switch statement then for if it's not, you know, that where I had the case switch statement. That was only the English strings. The French ones are different, the, the Mexican ones are different. That's probably why I don't, didn't demo that. But this one, Twitter stuff will just work because it's pulling in the one library and globalize will work as expected because it's pulling in all the, all the libraries. But my proof of concept one. All right. If you're using uh, Angular and you have Angular UI and you pull in Angular UI bootstraps, you can get like the date picker. Um, those automatically use the localization libraries built in Angular, so you can get your months and your your formatting and your um, abbreviations of, of your days of the week. So that stuff all works for you. All right. Choice and plural formatting. Okay, here's where you get a choice. You get to pick your favorite meta name. Do you vote for the any of you guys like names? Any of you guys know about uh, what's this Rage comic? This guy, the why you know guy. Anyway, this guy is like there's a certain name that this guy has, and this isn't either one of them. These are two texts from different names, that so they're on the wrong graphic. That's why it's funny. Um, it was funny for me, but I didn't even know that there was a field of mathematics. Okay, that's why I go to Wikipedia. Look at that mathematics. That's a real thing. And there's meta names. Huh? That's amazing. Um, all right. Here was remember the message format uh, JS when we were trying to get the the, the choice and portal formatting. So if I was going to do this in straight Angular. I might have to do a, an ng switch statement, which kind of is a you know and swap out my my DOM structure and, and then have some conditional things like ng switch dash when attributes for what my choices are. Um, and then I might could use the ng pluralize stuff. Um, to kind of split between, they have only two kind of uh, categories, plural categories in English, they got one and they have other. If you remember from message from JS, I had the one and I had the, the number symbol for other things, but I could actually had an equal zero where I could specifically put a number um, that I wanted. Like you can see here, I had an equal zero and then I had one and other. So that's very similar to kind of the one and other there. Um, and you can do the count. Um, can be string or an expression. So if I was going to pick that same thing and format it just kind of in Angular and HTML, um, this is probably what I would look like. I have div, I have this span with an ng switch, Mr. And Mrs. Miss, he, you know, she, she has, and then my friend. Zero is no friends. One is a uh, other, I format the number of friends. And we'll see this kind of 
in the demo later. Um, Twitter, Twitter CLARJS also has the same kind of function that lets gets plural rules. You'll see they have a one another rule. You know, event is one, return one, otherwise do others. So that's just kind of the common convention there. Um, all right. The same translations, right? Nothing on the internet that can exist with cats, right? So here's translations of cats. All right, so Angular Translate, back when we were looking at the other resources for Angular um, JS localization, there was this guy's library, and I said I'd be using it in the demo. So this is one that seems like it's um, kind of one of the more popular ones. It includes the, the API to do stuff as well as um, filters you can use. We'll see, yes. uh, we'll see a sample how that works. You can set up your preferred language um, in your translation provider, and it's just a big list of the hash map and hash maps effectively. Um, you can then just call a function to update to, like, I want to use English, and now I can even have a, in the template binding, I can just put favorite color, type it to translate, and I'll get the translation for my key of favorite color. Or in JavaScript, I can just call dollar, dollar filter inside of um, my controller, just call tran the translate filter, and then pass in my favorite color key, and it will return back whatever the translated value is. So either of those, those conventions work. Um, if as setting up my setting up my strings as a subset of the strings for my demo, just to show example, I might have fav underscore color as favorite color in English, color but, uh, favorito in Mexican, and colore prefere in French, and it's blue, azul, and blue. So those are my kind of key, you know, my key values. I set up the mappings, and then um, you can call it. Now in globalize, you can set your culture to English, U.S. You can just call localize and localize in your in your current culture, or you can call localize and pass in the culture, and you can get it back for the, the specific culture you have. So um, they have uh, set up the stuff very similar way. You add culture info to a culture like English US, you pass in messages, um, hash map in again with the same kinds of you know, key value structure. So let's take a little. Look at the uh, last little demo here. Um, <coughs> in here we have um, English, French, I'm uh, sorry, English, Spanish, French. And you'll see when I do that, the labels change dynamically. Right? <coughs> so in English, it's Mr., Mrs., Miss, you know, salutation, first name, last name, favorite color, friends. You know, in the summer down, I switch it to Spanish. All my labels change, right? Um, but you'll notice that my, if you look at the date down in the summary section, right? This is even though I'm switching to English, the 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 date is still formatted not not English because the way Angular has got the one locale that's bound at startup. So I would literally have to um, refresh it, and now I will get that. But now if I switch between the up again the date that's English is there. So we'll go back to English. I'll give myself uh, a million friends. Oh, is orange. Um, and then you'll see kind of in the in the summary section, um, I just have the straight up if you were just doing the simple like, oh I don't know, I don't have the, the choice formatting, the message format. If I just would do something like he slash she his slash her favorite color, colon orange, right? Because you know, he slash she has a million friends and then friends he's asked after it. Um, below in those two sections, I, I'm just in English only. Um, I didn't translate, I have the, the Angular kind of ng pluralize, ng kind of select stuff, and then the message format, um, JS version of it. So I can say he has a million friends. I can go ahead and switch it to Mrs. and it'll be she. I can set it to one and it'll be one friend. I can have no friends. So. And again, Google Translate, so if you're learning French, I maybe I wasn't uh, translating that right, but it seemed, it seemed right. Um, some of the, uh, some of the other English, um, English doesn't have gender differences on nouns and verbs and modifiers and stuff that some of the other languages do, so that's why the 
you might have a different, um, e even like the, there's, um, even the, just the name of friend, the friend in like uh, uh, Spanish is either amigo or amiga, depending on the gender of the, of the noun and stuff. So um, something like a message from a jazz becomes more important with those kind of languages that have differences of the, the grammar based on gender. Um, back. I'm at the end of the, the prepared material here. Ruth does this Spanish for questions. Uh, any questions? Anything we want to go back to demo? Any code you want to look at? For the actual translation, yep. have you found any good tools for, so like, have a developer and a translator that's like non technical to be able to actually input stuff? Um, that's a good question. So the, um, I'm working on a project, a um, big project where we're translating a, a, large, a large code base over. Um, and, and as we were doing that, and we're on an agile development cycle, so we're changing stuff every two weeks. And even if we have translations, we're trying to figure out how we do that. Um, if you think back to kind of um, maybe standard .NET um, format or even some JavaScript, I mean, you, might, you might have had uh, a sentence like that that says he has, you know, or favorite, his favorite color is, you might have bracket zero bracket, right? And you just know you're going to replace the color into this as the positional limit parameter zero. Okay. Well, now if I take that, um, or you last log in, or um, at, you know, boom, or last log in colon, boom, and you might have like a very bracket zero bracket. Now I'm a translator, right? What am I? And I want to translate that. What is that, right? What's zero? Is zero the date? Is it the date time? Is it the date and time? Like, what's the format there? So one of the one of our best practices there is um, we switch to the name the name parameter. So be, if you saw bracket date bracket, you know they're talking about a date. Or if you saw bracket date and time bracket, you, the translator knows the date and time. Um, now, if you are in Java and use the AIC library, you get that for free. If you're in JavaScript and use one of these libraries, you get that for free. If you're in .NET, you don't have a name parameter substitution library built in for free. Um, but what we did is we took the IC library and we compiled the Java code with the IK, IKVM software to actually produce a .NET library from the Java library. And we put, put already put a common wraparound anyway because I have a code base that's got some .NET modules, some Java modules, and some JavaScript code, and I wanted a universal API across the three, so if I move strings between modules because the code moves, okay. So that's an important thing. Okay, so you gotta structure your like, your, your, your strings in a way that, that can be read by a translator. But that's all not enough, so that we say, okay, now all our strings have, um, you know, we, we have, we standardize the Java properties files just to keep pulse value kind of old school, any style properties file across all platforms, and that's the library can read those. Um, and then we baked in um, comment, no, our comment lines, right? and I can't remember if we did above it or after another team worked, but we baked in comments, and then we have a round tripping scenario where we export all our data out and we put it in spreadsheets and we send it to the, um, on translators to work on, because right now we have a couple translators. Um, but it includes the, the language and the string and the key and the comments. And there's a spot for developer comments and there's a spot for translator comments. And then we archive those data files and we're able to compare those and we're able to know what changed and what didn't change and what hasn't happened. So we're working through some of that flow now. Um, it's relatively easy to do for one language you're translating into, but once you have multiples of language, um, project I worked on back in 2006, seven. we had six different UI languages. Um, and no one person knew all of them. So we had to have some sort of tool that does that. Eventually what you need to do, what we need to do, is take the output that we've generated and get it into some sort of translating, translation workflow tool that we can use. It's a challenge because whatever we find, I want to find these larger and Thompson Reuters inside of many apps we have. Um, and then you can, that, that translation tool can do notifications, you can get vendors to come in and do translations for you, you can get maybe even crowdsource some people to do translations for you, I think Twitter, Twitter might be doing that. Um, but then yeah, gotta, that's got to cycle back into the code, so you got to kind of have some sort of format you can round trip. So it seems like a lot of work, like it should have been solved by now, um, and maybe it has been, but we haven't quite found it. I don't think many companies do translation really well, like in a lot of large scale. But, those are some of the those are some of the tips. The other thing to, to uh, the other key is if the, my sentence you last logged in at bracket, I might want I want to change. Oh no, I want to be better. Maybe I want to say you last logged in on date 
and then the word at, and then bracket time bracket. If I change my string like that, that's like changing an API. It's like getting rid of your old API that had one parameter and having a new API that takes two parameters. If you've got people using that code or it's a shared piece of function, that's a breaking change. So now we have to figure out a pattern like, okay, well, that's a new key. You've got to treat those kind of like you're treating your REST endpoints or trying to be treating like your signatures. You won't, and you don't want to delete your old tests. You want your old tests to stick around to use the old keys so they break too. So you've got to be smart about those type of things. As well as our tooling, we can scan all our files and compare them and see if there's any missing translations or keys and stuff. So I don't know that we found a great tool for that, so we're building some more around um, because of the way just the time that some of the workflow, but yeah, it's a fun problem. Everything you talk to leverage will count to determine which oh, yeah. should be used. Is there anything in globalization that should be based on something else like location or anything other than locale? Um, it's really hard. Um, everything that we do, we, we try and sniff the locale from the user agent for the first guess. Right. But after the user has like picked something, then you want to save that like in a cookie or a local storage or something, or if you're logged in a preference your application. Because you never know when you're grabbing somebody else's computer or they're doing something else and they don't have access to it or they want it in their language. So that's kind of a, you know, I said you can use user agent kind of sniffing or accept language headers to do the kind of the first of the first pass, but you're not in control of those, so you have to store it. Uh, what we did do on our, not on our uh, process that serves up the page, but even some of our database um, REST APIs, we did actually overload and use the accept language header for that and trust that as the authority. And the reason is because on AJAX requests, you can guarantee you're sending it yourself. Or on a browser request, you can't guarantee it. Um, so we ended up using that in our infrastructure to determine which language you should return. Um, as opposed to having to reference some shared state or use a cookie on this time bar rest endpoint once you choose the real HTTP header. Because we get a lot of questions on our, on our apps about trying to use a, a safe like address for a profile or some oh. of those kinds of things instead of locale where it seems like locale is, should be preferred. But, um, okay. yeah. um, the other yeah, another interesting thing about trying to reuse the same, like my same URLs, but switching locale versus how my first path be in US or whatever, is it's a lot harder to do caching then um, of your resources if they're if the same URL serves up two for two different things. Please so, don't. You can always use a very header for those. Yeah. Then, then it should yeah. cache. Sure. To, to vary yeah. If if that all got no, that's true. It works and and uh, even. I don't know how that, I haven't done a lot of those that are strong facing, but I don't know how that works for even like SEO based indexing. I think maybe pass might, might if pass might actually make it seem like two separate sites to Google where a, a very header might not. So that's kind of maybe another thing why, why public facing sites always have the pass in it. Um, as far as translations and the keys, like how do, how do you name the keys? Uh, that's a good question. I, uh, um, in our bigger project, we've got a like almost a four-part dotted segment key that we have because we have got a multiple module, module code bases. So we always wanted the first segment of the key to be that, and then the second two segments to be kind of a context, like maybe which page it is. Maybe it's like this kind of the main web app, and you know, so the website module we call dot, and then maybe it's the home page dot the footer. You know, maybe it's the footer dot the hover text. Okay, so there's like, you know, there's sections of that. Because some of the keys are important because you're just looking at the key. Um, you want to be able to kind of guess where it's at, right, um, in your code base. So if there's a convention, do that. Uh, we actually also have a mode um, in our live debugging app where the, we can put our app into a mode that not only returns the translation, but it prefixes it with the actual key that was used for the translation. So when you're in the UI and you're looking at it, when you're trying to translate, it's like, oh, I need to translate this string, which, which key is it? You can actually put the app into a mode that dumps out the keys and the translations concatenated to each other. Um, as well as we use something called pseudo-internationalization, which just flips all the, like, like we did when I held down the A key and showed me all the other A's on there. Um, it does something similar to that. It's every letter that's normally A through Z and replaces it with another character that looks like an A through Z, but it's got some sort of a symbol on it. And then it pads it out, um, makes it longer, and it puts brackets around it. So you can flip our app into that mode, and now you can make sure everything's been localized. Because if you see a string that isn't padded out and has normal letters, you know that string isn't coming from my strings file. So either it's a piece of content that's coming from a content system, or I forgot to translate. So 
myself. Um, do you ever shortcut it as far as, I mean, do you have to have a key to each label, or can you do like, you know, if, if it's just a label, can the label itself be the key? Uh, if you look at software like um, um, Get Text, which has been used for a long time in the office, they, they will use the, the key, their English key is their label, and if they don't find it, they'll return it. And I think that helps when you translate some existing, existing code. Um, and that's got the benefit there. It's got the bad benefit is some people get lazy, and they don't translate stuff, because it always comes back and it works. Um, and it's got the bad benefit and you have to find it and like if you have some sort of convention that, that kind of tells you about where on the page it is, it kind of tells where to find it, but it makes it a little uglier to look in the code because you don't know what it, what it means and when you're using that mode, then you can kind of get it when you're reading the code. So it kind of maybe depends on, um, on the team and the workflow and how many things you want to do on the project, right? If you trust your developer to always translate or if you know you got a bunch of lazy people who are just trying to get it done by the iteration end. So they can go home and they just skip the translations. <laughs> but yeah, so that's, so that's the way the Git test has been doing for years. So. Yeah. Have you talked about the validation yet? No, I missed the first part. Uh, about what kind of validation? Well, I, a couple months ago, we were we had a bug on our site where um, they were in Europe and. I think they were typing in a dot, and it was going through because it was basically using English validation okay. instead of the comma. You know, and so I looked into Globalize, because yep. I think that was what Scott Guthrie's project, and then jQuery took it on, and then they, they ran into a lot of bugs with it and basically sidelined it. That's kind of what I, the last Oh, one. so they had, a, they had a parse, some parse functions in there that, oh, that I was expecting was going to validate. I didn't actually do any, any validation on the, on the stuff that I've done here. So I'm just curious what, what, no, what, your, what your experience is like, because I looked into it and, and there was this big long list of bugs, yeah. and basically the jQuery team decided that they were going to re rewrite it and put it into the core instead of using Globalize, and oh, that basically it was kind of on hold, and okay. I just didn't know what your experience with that was. No, that's interesting. I don't, I don't know on that. I, it might be interesting to look at the Twitter CLDR one, because they're pulling in, they're, there's a go, they have a lot of functions in there, and they're pulling in the, the ICU data, so I wonder if they have if they do validation against the format strings too. I don't know, I don't know the answer to that. It's a good question. has a big long list of global uh, validation yeah. functions, but they were slot of bugs. Yeah, and those are based on data sets that probably came out of the .NET, um, or the CLR, or the Windows, Windows um, locale space, so maybe, you know, maybe using something that was, you know, that was based on the IC instead of based on .NET would, might work better. I don't know though, that's okay. a good question. 